Thank you for joining us and thank you for participating in the Primary Science Getting Started online course. Um, my name is Tanya Shields and I was one of the course tutors, so you probably recognise my face and my colleague. I am also, I'm Sarah Dagnall, also one of the course tutors. Um, and thank you to the people that posted questions for us. We have a few questions here which we think link quite nicely um, and bring things around. So they give us a nice summary for how to teach primary science in the classroom. I'm going to start with the question from Catherine who asks about how we can evidence differentiation um, other than questioning and outcome. And I have to say, this is a question that's really quite challenged mm. us because the way we like to focus on science in the classroom is to give children the opportunity to discuss their observations. And that means that good questioning from the teacher does lead to um, that differenti differentiated outcome in the in the practice. Um, reading between the lines, though, Catherine, I'm thinking that this might be coming from an external point of view as to as that accountability from the teacher. How are you evidencing evidencing your thought process in terms of making sure that the children are attaining at the right level? So I've pulled out uh, this this slide here. So. You might have come across this before. It's solo taxonomy. We can pop a link to the extra information on this because other um, other teachers might find this helpful. But solo taxonomy, it's it differs in the, the graphical representation of it. I think it's quite accessible when you're planning lessons. So it starts off with the pre-structural stage where children know absolutely nothing. And you've got that symbol there. The next stage would be moving on to unistructural, where we would expect children or the children at that stage know one thing. And then we have um, multistructural, where they know a few things. And then we get to the relational stage, and I'm going to have to put my piece of paper down. But that's where they're joining up all their thinking, and we've, we've got the, the representation here. And then we've got the abstract, extended abstract, where they're moving on to applying that to different um, subject areas. So what you can do with this type of work and what's on this piece of information here, we have some some verbs to to identify the type of things that the children will be doing. So in unistructural, um, children would be um, defining, they would be identifying, they would doing doing simple things and they would be, I can't read that last word, hmm. um, they'll be following a simple procedure on there. Whereas when we're getting up to the higher level, we'll be getting children to focus on comparing and contrasting and explaining, ca classifying and analysing. So as a teacher, it gives you a structure for planning differentiated tasks. So you would have the children and again, the children would be familiar with this structure and they could self-identify and then pick the tasks which they think are most suited. So if you start an activity around classification, the children know nothing about it. You would have a task that introduces children step by step to what classification means. And it would have a simple um, set of items to classify, whereas children working at a slightly higher level, they might know about grouping. So you'd ask the children to think about ways that they could group in different ways. And then the multi-structural, you might be a little bit more um it gives the children a little bit more freedom there and get them to actually select their own items. I think that mm. might be a way of doing that. But this, there's lots of research around this. There's lots of evidence about it. And the, this, what's nice is that the, the tasks and the um, resources that go with it are really child friendly. And the structure, for me, it's self-explanatory. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, Sarah's going to go on to the next question around um, how we plan and record in science, which I think leads on quite nicely. Yep. Yeah, I've got a question that's come in from Susan, who asked, how would primary science team rate the importance of recording information for revision and reference purposes? Well, it is important that we do evidence what we, we do with the children in the classroom. Um, we need to have that there. Again, and it's kind of coming back to you. A lot of the time that's for external reasons or maybe for monitoring purposes and proving progression with the children into, inside school as well. Um, so we do need to have some sort of evidence there. However, that recording doesn't need to come at the expense of the children actually being hands-on and practical and actually that they're learning the most in that sort of way. We're not bothered that, well, we are bothered, but we're not just wanting the children to sit there and write some science in their books just so we've got that evidence. There are different ways that we can do it. And if we are going to spend our time doing that write-up, then that maybe needs to be put into our literacy time rather than our science time. 
Um, which leads on actually to your next question, which was when parents um, or other staff view my books, is it important that they see completed experiments written up by the pupils? So you can probably gauge from my last answer that the answer to that is going to be no. Um, we are looking again that there is some evidence of this, but not whole investigations. Children writing up whole investigations is just going to put them off, actually, science. It's not actually, again, the doing and the learning. That is simply a literacy-based task. So again, if you are wanting to do that, perhaps move that into your literacy time. In terms of how we can evidence this then, there are lots of different other ways that we could do it. We could be taking photos, we could be producing charts, we could be making little videos. Um, and um, in that way, the children are still having that practical learning, but they're also getting that evidence in there. And this is perfectly acceptable evidence for showing external people or actually our SLT in school as well. We also need to make sure that when we are doing our practical work that we're focused on a target. So if you are doing a whole investigation, if you think of the working scientifically um, statements, here's a national curriculum, working scientifically statements there for key stage one, I don't want to be focusing on every single one of those in one session, which is what you would be doing if you are actually getting them to do a whole writer of almost all of those, because they would almost all fit. If you were doing um, a written piece of work in, in your writing time, you wouldn't try to, to work on every single standard at the same time. It'd be impossible. And it's the same in science. If you're actually doing some work with the children, you need to be focused in on the objective that you're doing. And that's the evidence that you need to be producing. Not for everything else, because the children haven't had that learning. If you are teaching them about one thing, that is what they're going to maybe be writing up or they're evidencing through videos or charts or however you're doing that. You asked one final question as well, which says, um, when there is so little time for doing practical work, um, how do we actually manage to evidence this? And also, um, for, especially for children who are weaker or SEN children, what can we do to make that slightly easier for them? Well, there's a number of different things that we could do that doesn't require us always to be writing up. We could be getting the children or us to produce big books for them. And that can be a joint task between us maybe putting things into the big book and also the children producing work to go in there as well. And it just needs to be simple as maybe writing thoughts onto little post-it notes and sticking that straight into there. Could be putting some pictures in there with tiny little explanations underneath. And that could again be produced by the children or by us, depending on the age of the children or ability of the children. It could be that we take photos or videos of the children. Having technology around can be really useful for that because actually there's a lot of apps on here that allow the children to do that themselves. Um, popular ones seem to be things like Pic Collage, Skitch, um, and there's also an online app called Seesaw which allows you to actually store that information as well so you can have the children's work all there. And if you do get external Ofsted or anybody coming in, you could say, hey, have a look at this and just give them the iPad to have a look at. You could also be getting um, children to act things out. Your children that struggle with their writing could maybe be recording their answers on little sound buttons. Um, and you could be making use of the other adults that you've got if you, ha if you are lucky enough to have them these days in the classroom. But possibly they could be sitting there and actually writing down some of the thoughts of the children. So they're all brilliant ideas, Sarah. Thank you. Um, one thing that um, sticks with me is when we're doing things in the classroom that we should, we should question why we're actually doing them. And if the reason that we're doing that type of work in the classroom isn't to move the children's learning forward, then we should question why we're actually doing it. And we have seemed to have gotten to this culture of this accountability and trying to prove that we're doing, doing something. And the only way to prove that we've done it is to have evidence in the mm. children's box and, and I think there's a, a valuable bit of, a, bit of evidence in there that we don't draw enough. If the class teacher has observed something happening and that they say that the child can do it then that is also evidence and I think teachers need to have the confidence to actually yeah. stand up and say I plan to do this lesson this is what I saw happening and this is evidence of it and if you'd like to question the child further I'm sure they'll demonstrate that understanding. So um, there's lots there and there's, there's things which maybe take a bit more courage and confidence when mm. you're starting teaching. But certainly as an experienced teacher, stand up. If you've seen what you've, what's happening in your classroom, 
and you believe it to be true, then yep. then that that is equally good evidence as well. And actually, so. that is the common practice. If you think mm. about your early years as well, that is exactly yeah. what they do. And um, this leads us on to our next question, which was from Katie, who says, although you should focus on teaching and assessing one particular skill, why do you not encourage full investigations? It is not better. Is it not better for them to practice what they have previously learnt? Well, Katie, it's not so much that we're saying don't do full investigations. It's more about what I was coming to with Susan, that we need to be focused in on what we are teaching the children. Again, we wouldn't get them to do all of the statements for working scientifically in one session. So if you were doing an investigation about measuring, it's not saying that you wouldn't get the children to carry out the investigation. It's saying that actually with the planning side of it, that might be something that we give the children. So we might actually say, you're going to carry out this investigation. And then we might get the children to actually do the measuring side of it. And then that is the bit that we're evidencing in, in books or again, through photos or whatever. It's about being focused because again, you couldn't actually teach the children full stops and capital letters um, if you were also doing full stops, capital letters, paragraphs, um, sentence structure and everything else. It's the same in science. You can't do everything at once. So it's just about being focused in on your targets and what you're looking for. Our last question is from Francis and it's about the best way to group students. And we didn't really come up with an answer for this one because um, the children in the classroom dictate what happens and it depends on the really activity does. that you're doing. Um, so we quite often favour mixed groups. Um, so that can be mixed ability, mixed um, mixed gender. You might, if you're working in a smaller group, be working with mit mixed age groups as well. Um, but it really does depend on the task of what you're doing and what your class is like. So I remember a particular class that I was teaching um, and the, we had an issue with behaviour and the amount of noise, the work level of independence. And for a certain period in that school year, I was reluctant to have the children mm. working in mixed groups because I wanted a bit of structure. Well, not a bit of structure, a lot of structure where I was um, being quite tough on the children and guiding them through all the steps because I was trying to develop, establish that, that classroom behavior in the classroom that I wanted and then could lead me to for them working independently. Um, again, with the activities you were talking about earlier, mm. focusing on specific, a specific skills. So if you've got a lesson when you're focusing on recording and you know that it's going to be data heavy and you're going to expect the children to record in a specific way. That's going to require a certain, letter, uh, certain level of mathematical skills. So in that instance, I might ask my children to work in, in sort of ability groups because my children with my higher mathematical skills will be working completely independently, whereas there's going to be children who are, need extra support with their mathematical mm. skills, which are going to have a more structured task, which kind of links to our first question about differentiation. So if you've got tasks where they're developing skills which have clear differentiated tasks then you're going to want you to group your children in a in, in uh, sort of a level abilities um, if you've got children that are working outside you might have again you might have some children who are good at working independently or children who are good at working in as a role of a leader working with the less less independent children so they're learning those those skills as well those skills, skills which aren't listed in the national curriculum um so apology i don't think i've really answered that but it's I'd, I'd maybe just add a little bit to yeah. that in that occasionally you've got time where you want um your lower ability children to answer a question and it mm. is worth thinking in those cases that um uh, many of those lower ability children might just function a little bit slower yeah. cognitively, which means they'll just take a little bit longer to think about their answers. So if they are in mixed ability groups, sometimes it is maybe having to hold back um, mm. those higher ability children a little bit to give the lower ability children to actually think for themselves and come out with some answers. Um, that's not suggesting that I would go for grouping them by ability all the time. But what I'm suggesting is, as Tanya said, is that it does depend on the task and what you're wanting yeah. to do. So, yeah, yeah. So, so for specific tasks, we could suggest one way of um, grouping them, um, but it's going to be different according to the task. So yeah. um, it's just practicing it, I think, and, and experiencing and seeing how 
observing how the children work in those different groups. And you've got the 12 months to do that with your class. Definitely. Um, you could almost carry out your own little science experiment yeah. um, to see how children work. Introduce the job roles. See how that goes with them. That might help. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, Sarah and I were both going to say thank you very much for your time. Um, if you do have any further questions, please post them online and encourage your friends and colleagues to, to join in the next run of um, Teaching Primary Science Getting Started. We'd love to see you here at the centre as well. If you want to join us on any of the face-to-face -face courses that we run, you'll be able to find all of the courses that we've got available and coming up on our website.